Good morning. Hope your weekend is going well. <clears throat> mine, uh, I hope it's going better than mine, actually. I went to get off the couch yesterday, and my back went out. So, and then, uh, yeah, then I went to plug in my computer this morning, and I was wearing a, a, a different pair of pants because they split open. So, you're welcome for that visual. I'm sure your weekend is going better than mine. <laughs> oh, man. Now, we're having a good summer. We're going through the book of Galatians, Paul's letter to the church, uh, churches in Galatia. Um, when I was in school, I actually did not like school. I, some people like school. I was not somebody who liked school. Not because I didn't like the learning, which I didn't. I didn't really like the studying, but those weren't the reasons. The, the reason I actually hated school was the amount of anxiety that it produced in me. Like, I didn't know where I fit. And part of it was a little bit of a gift. I was actually able to kind of float in between some of the different social groups. But the downside of that was I didn't actually have my own social group. I, I had a friend. Uh, I, did, I had a friend. Like, that's one friend. I had one really close friend. And I didn't really have a group, though. I didn't, I didn't have a place to belong. I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't fit in with, with the, like, the super big, like, athletic people. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't smart enough to hang out with the, the smart crowd. Uh, I didn't fit in with any of the other subcategories uh, that we might divide people. And um, I didn't know, though, that I actually dealt with anxiety in school until I was a youth pastor and I started showing up to kids' lunchrooms. And I would be walking into the school and this wave of anxiety would come over. I'm like, what the hell? I'm a full-grown man, I think. So, like, what gives? And so I would be walking into the school and it hit me one day as I was having a conversation in, in the, with some students in the middle school cafeteria. I had gone from table to table just kind of interacting. I knew uh, several of the kids in there, and they were spread out. So I was going around and talking to the different tables. And after I had left one table, I went to another table and, and sat with them and just started talking. And the first thing they said to me was, why are you sitting at that table? And I said, uh, I've been sitting at a lot of tables. I'm like, what do you mean? And this girl looked at me. She goes, you shouldn't talk to them. I said, okay, why shouldn't I talk to them? She said, we don't like them, so don't talk to them. And instantly I was like brought right back to being in that, in that like for myself in school. And I thought, oh, I do not like this. Like, I don't like any part of it. And, and it occurred to me that, that a lot of it was actually due to all of the hierarchical systems that we have not just in school, but in the rest of the world. Anytime I have this sense of hierarchy, I think, okay, where do I fit? Where do I fit? Uh, we, we've talked about it, it was, it was quite a while ago, but we talked about there was a study done um, uh, on building the tallest standing tower, and this company put together all sorts of different teams. Some were like structural engineers, some were artists, some were like bookkeepers, and then one of the teams was, was a group of, of kids, and they were given a certain amount of time, all the same materials, and they had to build a tall structure, and the team that consistently produced the tallest structure were the kids, like elementary school age kids. And they, the, the conclusion that they came to was that the reason the kids could do it better is because they didn't worry about who was in charge or who did what. They just started shouting stuff at each other and getting the job done. But in the other teams, they're like, okay, who's going to call the shots? Who's going to be in charge? Who's influential? Who's not influential? And there was kind of this vying for position. Those are the things I do not like. I don't like those. Like, it makes me feel anxious. And I think at some level... All of us have probably been in some sort of situation where you, where you just had the sense, like, I don't belong. I don't fit. Right? I, I, this is like, there's whatever is happening in that moment is communicating to you that you're not doing enough or, or you don't have enough or, or you're not the, the right type of personality to fit in there. And that's really how we figure out our fit. Our fit and, and the way we're accepted socially is based on what we can produce or who we are. Right? Uh, maybe it's a certain uh, uh, level of success in, in the workplace that gains you access and success or gains you accept acceptance in a certain group of people. Maybe it's having a certain accumulation of goods. Um, maybe it's, it's having a, a certain uh, status um, economically that gets you into a group. Maybe it's simply who you are and your personality, what you provide to this group. People like having you around because you make them laugh, right? These are the ways that we find our acceptance, 
And in every single society, there is a hierarchy, and there is a groups that you fit in and you don't fit in. And each of these little interactions is a miniature touch point of reminding you either that you are good enough or you aren't good enough based on who you are and what you can do. I don't like that. But it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's pervasive in every single society, and it has been, not just in ours, not just in other contemporary societies, but through generations, throughout all of history. But what if there's another way? What, is the, what if there's an alternative way of experiencing acceptance, especially even in our social structures? There's good news in the book of Galatians today. We're going to be diving into chapter 3 of Galatians. If you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in Galatians 3, starting in verse 26. Otherwise, you can follow up on the screen with us. Maybe you want to pull out your phone. You can actually just Google. Uh, you can Google the, the, um, the Scripture passage and, and pull that up there. But we're going to dive in. Um, chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, uh, this is a letter written to a group of churches in what would be modern-day, part of modern-day Turkey, western Turkey. And Paul is writing back. He started these churches, and now he's writing back because there's some concerns. When Paul came through, he told them about the good news of Jesus. He told them about the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And all of these things they accepted and they received... And then as Paul moved on, there were churches. There was, lead, there was some, some small leadership structures that were put in place, and Paul moved on. But then there was another group of people that came along, and they were also followers of Jesus, but they were Jewish Christians. And, and the difference is that this area was predominantly not Jewish. It was what was considered Gentile, not Jewish. They, they didn't follow the law of Moses. They didn't follow the Old Testament practices and, and regulations. So this, this group of Jews comes along, and they believe in Jesus. They have that commonality, but then they come in and say, okay, great, you have put your faith in Jesus, now we need you to do something for us. In order to belong in the family of God, you have to follow the Jewish religious practices. And it got so bad that even um, one of the, 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 the leaders of the church, one of the closest followers of Jesus, Peter, comes to visit Paul, and, and we covered this a couple of weeks ago, but um, as Peter is eating with Paul, and he's eating with all these Gentiles. There's no problems at all. They're just, they're, everything's great. He's spent a lot of, he's like vacationing with them. It's a good time. They're getting along. But then this group of Judaizers comes in, and they see uh, Paul, or they see uh, Gentiles and Peter interacting with each other. And as soon as Peter sees the Judaizers comes in, he come in, he removes himself. He steps back, and Paul has to call him out. Paul says, hey, you were living like a Gentile in one moment, but as soon as your friends get here, you start living a different way. That's not okay. What you're doing, Peter, is you're communicating to this group of Gentiles that in order to be accepted, they have to do these things. You said it's all good believing in Jesus. We have that commonality, but now they have to follow these rules and regulations. They have to eat this and not eat that. They have to bathe this way. They have to wash their hands. They have to be circumcised. They have to follow these, uh, observe these days and religious festivals. And if they don't do that, they're not accepted by you. Paul says, Peter, you, you, you communicated that to this group of people the moment you distanced yourself when the Judaizers showed up. You confirmed everything that they've been telling us is true, and it's not. And as Paul is laying all of this out in his letter, he gets to the point where we pick up. And he wants to tell them why it doesn't work, why it's not true, why their acceptance by the Jewish population is not hinging on their acceptance of the Jewish religious practices and laws. And that's why Paul starts going into this in verse 26. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. So in Christ Jesus, to be in Christ Jesus means you've put your faith in them. That's why uh, Paul says you are all uh, in Christ Jesus through faith. The faith that you have that Jesus is who he said he is, 
that he is the son of God, that he has been sacrificed on your behalf for your sin to reconcile us to God, that has given us entrance into the family of God. It's through, if you are in Jesus, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. Now, this is a significant, direct hitting the nail on the head moment for Paul because the crowd that had been coming around them and been putting uh, pressure on the church of Galatia was saying, no, to be children of God, you have to be Jewish. That's our birthright. You, you, may, you may be saved, you may be forgiven by God, but you aren't children of God until you start doing these things. And so you start observing the way of life that we have. You aren't children of God. Who are, the Ju- who, are, who are the children of God according to the Judaizers? Only those who observe the law of Moses. Only those who observe the laws found in the Old Testament and follow all of the, tra- the traditions of the forefathers based on it. Those are the ones who are acceptable by God. Those are the true children of God. And Paul says, no, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are children of God. Now, I want to point out something really significant because the word for children, the the NIV actually translate this Greek word as children because they want to pick up on the nuances of what Paul is saying, and and he really does get to these points later on, but the word actually isn't children in general. The word is actually sons or sonship. In Christ Jesus, you all have sonship. Now, uh, this isn't about gender. This is actually about a political status, a family status situation. Uh, Scholar Douglas Moo uh, comments on it saying, Sonship in the Greco-Roman world symbolized a certain status and right of inheritance. You see, for Paul, he's not pointing to people being male or female in this situation. He's talking about a status before God. In the Greco-Roman worldview, uh, sons had a different status than anybody else. Uh, Even in Jewish society, sons had a prominent place in the family. Uh, Sons, especially firstborn firstborn sons, would have the the, the largest share of the inheritance. They got all of the wealth. They got a, a, a disproportionate amount of status and honor just by being male in their family. And there were actually stipulations in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, in the Jewish law, to allow for a family, well, what what happens if I have children and none of them is a male? My family line's going to die because that that means my, my daughter has to trade her family identity for her married family identity. And if she gets all of my property, then all of my property goes with her and our land, our lineage, it's all gone. And so there were even stipulations in that because a woman's property wasn't her own. She couldn't actually receive an inheritance the same way a son could. You see, this this concept of sonship is incredibly significant. It, It had to deal with our status and our right of inheritance. And so Paul says, listen, if your faith is in Christ Jesus, not only are you in the family of God, you have a right to the same level of inheritance as a firstborn son. That's powerful. Like, in, in the family of God, if all you've done is put your trust in Jesus, you are on equal footing with anybody else in the family of God. And this is a direct slap in the face to the Judaizers because Paul is saying not only are they in the family, but they have the top level of status in the family of God just like everybody else. If you are in Christ, you have a status that is elevated. Not to be better than others, not to lord it over others, but to understand that you have an equal access to the family and rights, the status of a child of God, the inheritance of a godly kingdom. This is a significant statement for Paul. He he continues to unpack it. He says, for all of you, who were baptized into Christ Jesus, this is verse 27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. 
Now, Paul brings up baptism, and he brings up what, what many believe to be actual water baptism. Now, baptism, especially um, in, in the time approaching the, the era of Jesus, when Jesus was walking the earth, physically, uh, there, there was a, a, a specific belief about baptism, and it was entrance into the family of God. So we actually see this. If you go back and you read some of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see John, a guy named John the Baptist coming on the scene. And he, he was, his ministry was precluding Jesus's. It, it, it was before Jesus's ministry. And he was considered as one who was preparing the way. And how he did that was he would, came out of this like madman sort of wilderness. He was a crazy dude. And he goes into the river and he starts baptizing people. And he co- starts calling all the crowds out to be baptized, which was a significant statement. Because baptism, especially the type of baptism that John was doing, was usually reserved for people who were switching Um, from uh, one ethnicity to Judaism. They were outside of the family of God, and now through repentance, through confession, and through baptism, they are being accepted into the family of God. They are now considered Jewish. Whatever they were before, they are now Jewish. Okay, But there's another level here. Uh, Part of the process was that as people go into the waters of baptism, they would take off their old robes. They, they They would strip down naked, and then they would put on a new white robe, and then they would go into the water. And this was the symbolism of being a new person in the family of God. So Paul speaks of this practice of baptism, and he says, listen, if you have been baptized into Christ Jesus, you have to understand something. You and I have been clothed in Christ. It's as if you're taking off your old identity. You're taking off everything that was significant about who you are, good, bad, or otherwise, everything that made you fit into the world around you, and now you are being clothed in Christ. You are putting on a new identity. Paul has said this in different ways as he writes. He's, He's written other letters where he writes, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Paul here talks about being clothed in Christ. You've taken off the old garments and you've put on a new garment. You've put on a new way of being identified. He says, if you've been baptized in Christ Jesus, you have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's a new new way of being identified. Now, Paul would look at the Gentiles and he'd say, you're not Gentiles anymore. He would look at the Jewish people, the Judaizers, even the Jews who weren't trying to, to persuade people uh, that, that were non-Jewish to follow their ways. He would look at all of them and he'd say, listen, you're not, you're not Gentile anymore. You're, you're not Jewish anymore. You are clothed in Christ. You have a new identity. You've put on something entirely different. The moment you were baptized in Christ, the moment you put your trust in him, you are now in Jesus. You are now identified by Jesus, that is the single most significant identifier of you and I. Now, Paul really wants to drive it home, and he considers all this, if you are in Christ Jesus, you 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 have the status of sons in the kingdom, and then he says, uh, listen, if you were baptized into Christ, you have this identity of being clothed in Christ, and now, now Paul starts looking at the outworking of all of this and starts logically thinking through it, and he goes to the next logical step in verse 28 where he says, there is neither, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And we just talked about sonship and, and the significance of what was going on there uh, politically, socially, even religiously. Uh, gender had connotations to it. It absolutely had connotations to it. It limited some people from accessing certain things. It, it removed people from certain social situations. There were things they could not participate in. There were not rights available to everybody else equally across the board. Slaves did not have the same rights as free people. Women did not have the same rights as men. They didn't have the, the same access politically. They didn't even have the same protections politically. Now Paul starts to see this bleeding into the church and he wants to do something about it. The message that he's sharing, according to Alan Cole, as he comments on this passage, 
He helps us under, uh, Cole helps us understand what's going on by saying the Jewish male gave regular thanks to God in the liturgy that he was born, uh, not born a Gentile or a woman. Paul would then be pointing out that in Christ, all the old dividing walls that were accepted and even extolled in Judaism had been broken down. Now, what Paul is not doing, contrary to some popular thought today, Paul is not erasing the significance of gender. He's not erasing the significance of male, female, or difference in general. Paul isn't trying to get rid of difference. There, there's, a, there's a beauty to difference. There's a, something to celebrate in different. But what Paul is trying to do is he's, he's driving home the point of even what the Jewish people celebrated. So the liturgy that Cole points out is, is a written prayer that many Jewish men would pray, and they would give thanks to God that they were born Jewish men. Now, that might seem ridiculous to us, but you have to understand something about the ancient world. Today, we talk a lot about racism, and, and I do believe that there's a lot of, of stuff still happening today. Much of it we're not even aware of. However, uh, today is different than then. They lived in a time when racism and gender inequality was actually not just something that was argued about. It, wasn't, it actually wasn't argued about at all because it was completely accepted. Nationalism and ethnic identity and superiority of male versus female was something that wasn't argued about because it was just believed. It was accepted. They, they lived in actually an incredibly racist culture, and overtly so. They didn't, they didn't try to hide it. They didn't try to minimize it. They were like, no, we are better than you because we are Jews. No, we are better than you because we are Roman citizens. No, we are better than you because we are male Roman citizens who are also Jewish. And they would stack up the significance in their hierarchy, and Paul looks at that and he says, this is horrible. You want to live according to that pattern? You want to live according to that hierarchy? then you're going to be under a curse. But thank God that he freed us from the curse of all of these things. And in Christ, we have been baptized into his family and we put on a new identity. Therefore, we are going to break down all of those social structures so that there is no one who is better than the other in the kingdom. Paul isn't trying to erase difference. Paul is trying to erase, according to Alan Cole, these dividing walls that keep people separate. Again, scholar Douglas Moo has more to say on the subject. He says, the saying in this verse is rightly prized as far-reaching and fundam a fundamental claim about the way in which the distinctions that quote-unquote matter in the world we live in are to be left at the door of the church. The things that make us distinct and better and one up and not fitting in this group or fitting in this group, the things that we use to leverage to work our way up in the social ladder, those distinctions do not matter in the kingdom because you and I took off that robe and we put on the robe of Christ. I love that Moo says all of those distinctions that seemingly matter need to be left at the door of the church. There's no place for it in here. There's no place for that kind of distinctive difference where one person says, no, you don't fit. No, you're not good enough. You haven't lived the way I have. I've been, I've been sitting in this seat for 30 years. It struck me um, when Janine and I got to participate in a, a pilgrimage to Wales um, over a year ago, uh, we uh, went into a lot of these different chapels, and it, one of the things that struck us immediately was some of the plaques that were on the benches. And, and one of the practices at the time was that you could buy your section. It was a way that they generated money for the church. You could buy this section, this row of seats for your family. That was your section. Well, you, don't, you can't sit here. You're not part of our family. Now, we don't have plaques on the chairs here. You can't buy a row. We're not into that. But I think there are other ways that when we don't check how we operate and how we make choices that we communicate to others, you don't fit. 
I, I think even as we approach communion, when we practice this this morning, I've heard it in so many churches, you are disqualified from the table of Jesus if you have any unconfessed sin in your life. When was that a rule? Didn't Jesus come to save sinners? Once you confessed your sin, were you perpetually perfect? I'm not. If you are, we should probably swap positions. So if, if like, you're living that way now and you're like, no, I was forgiven by Jesus and I never sinned again, like, just tell me right now and we'll, we'll switch out. I've see, even seen hierarchy in the church where people have to honor the pastor in a certain way, but last I checked, I'm pretty sure that being in Christ erased all of those things. It's not that there's no sense of spiritual authority, but that spiritual authority in the church works differently. And time and time again, there's this bleeding in of the world's hierarchy into the church. And just like Paul, I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. Because you and I, we put our faith in the same Jesus. We were baptized in the same waters of baptism. And we have been clothed, each of us, with Christ Last I checked, that changed everything. When Jesus showed up, it changed everything. The, the, the seemingly significant dividing walls of the world started being torn down. In fact, the area that Paul lived in in Antioch was considered kind of this, um, kind of this experiment where everybody was on equal status, and it was actually causing a big, uh, it was causing a big issue in the city around them. The, the world didn't know what to do with them. They're like, they don't worship an idol. They, they believe in this Jesus, that he was the son of God. Uh, they, they allow women to eat with, they'll just eat with anybody. They actually started calling the early church Christians atheists because that's how it looked from their perspective. They're like, we just don't get what's going on. They must not believe in a God at all. They're just accepting anybody. We've come a long way. I don't mean that in the best way. We have to remind ourselves of something incredibly important, and it's Paul drives the point home. He says in verse 29, as he wraps it all up, he says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If it was not clear before it is now, if it wasn't clear to the Gentiles and the Jews, the Jews who were saying, no, we are heirs of Abraham's promise, not the Gentiles, Paul says, no, in Christ, if you are in Christ, you are all part of Abraham because even Abraham himself was accepted by God based on faith not observance of the law. And you can test that. You can read through every single story about Abraham and, and Abraham's acceptance before God was always based on trusting God and God alone and that's it. It was never about observing a ritual perfectly. It was always about trusting God over trusting himself. That's called faith. And if we have that kind of faith, we are all equals at the table. In fact, Paul's point being driven home is this. The kingdom is the only place where everyone is truly equal. Do, do you catch that? There's not a single place anywhere else on the face of the earth throughout time, space, or history where people are more equal than they are in the church in the kingdom of God, and the church is kind of a microcosm of the kingdom, but the kingdom of God is where things happen the way God wants them to happen. It's the way he governs, it's the way he serves, it's the way he rules and reigns and interacts with people. And he displayed this in the person of Jesus who then showed his disciples and he sent all of his disciples into the world to preach the good news of the kingdom. And part of the good news of the kingdom is this, that there is not a single place in the face of the earth where people are more equal than here. It was said at one time in the history of America that the hour people spend in church is the most segregated hour in the world, and I believe that was true. But praise God, what I see now, even as I even look around this room, I see people of different socioeconomic status, people of different skin colors, people of, you would not be in the room today with the people around you if it weren't for Jesus. 
Do you get that? You might see them around the community, but you would never interact with them. You would never sit in the same room with them if it weren't for Jesus. And that's Paul's point. It's Paul's point that Jesus erases all of those dividing walls where I'm better than you or you're better than me or I feel inadequate or I don't have enough or I can't be enough or I can't do enough to be accepted by you. And and Paul says, no, Jesus made us acceptable. And our status is all on equal footing. We are all in Christ. That's it. You and I are clothed in Christ. I thank God. Like, I thank God that I am in the church. Last week I started with, I'm not sure I like being in the church all the time because I have some issues with it. But one of my favorite things about the church, one of the reasons I'm thankful to be in the church is because I would never get to to meet and be around people the way I do in the church. There's not another place I've experienced that, and it's Jesus that makes all the difference. In fact, historians and sociologists would say that every area of society where progressive acceptance of individuals, regardless of who they are, what they do, how they feel, all of those things, even when you take it to a real extreme, would have no founding if it weren't for Jesus. Do they line up with Jesus? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is Jesus and the Jesus-oriented community, the equality in the kingdom of God is what makes it possible for us to debate things like who is welcome, who is this, who is that, who is... F- All of those things that we argue about have its roots in early Christianity where they did the wildly appropriate and they started dividing the social structures that... Div- uh, they started tearing down the social structures that divided people. And when it started creeping in the church, Paul said, no, this is Jesus' table and everybody is welcome. Anybody who professes Jesus is welcome around the table. Everybody who wants to experience the love of Jesus is welcome around the table. Anybody who has, has looked at Jesus and said, I want some of that, I want a part of Jesus in my life, they are in the family of God. And every other identity is taken off and the the clothing of Christ is put on. That's true unity. That's real unity. Not because we don't have differences. We have differences. And there's things that you and I are going to disagree about even what it means to follow Jesus. But guess what? Even those differences can still be in the same room if we're in Christ. And that is our primary concern. I want to call us to a greater level of unity today. I want to call us to a greater level of understanding the equal footing in status, the equal status as sons before Jesus. And I mean that not in gender terms, but in terms of inheritance of the kingdom of God for us today. I want to call us to that level of understanding today. And I want to give you a few ways that you can practice, a few ways that you can put on this new identity in Christ. And the first one is this. I would ask each of us, check your tradition. Check your tradition, because here's what I found. And this goes across what we're talking, beyond what we're talking about today. It goes to other aspects of living out our, our faith in Jesus. But we have to check our tradition, because what I found is most of the places of disagreement don't come from theological differences. They come from what we were taught in churches or what we were taught in society. In churches, we would say, no, we don't believe, uh, for example, women are able to do that in the church, whatever that is. We don't believe women are able to do that in the church. My argument to, be, to you would be, that's actually a traditional teaching, it's not scriptural teaching. But then we also learn stuff from society. We learn stuff from the social fabric around us of what it means to fit in, and we learn that, well, that we, we don't really do things that way. That's not how we were brought up. I've heard that a lot. That's not how I was brought up. That's fine, because how you were brought off was part of the old clothing that you took off and you put on Christ. Most of, I believe, most of the disagreements that we have aren't theological, steeped in in scriptural study, looking at the heart, character, and the way Jesus operated. But they have been twisted traditions handed down to us, just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Judaizers. We took something good, something that was right for a time, 
but we turned it back into law. And we said, no, if you don't line up with me in my tradition, you don't belong. We have to check our traditions. That's for us, most of the time, most of us, it's the driver is not what we believe about Scripture or Jesus. It's what we believe that we've just blindly accepted. And it's our tradition. Whenever somebody's uncomfortable with something that happens, that's, that's usually uh, somewhat of a gray area, I always ask them to check their tradition. Because the, the source of that discomfort is usually there. It's not usually here or in the person of Jesus. Well, I've never experienced anything like that before. Well, that doesn't make it wrong. <laughs> uh, that's not the way we did things growing up. Well, that doesn't make it wrong. My church taught me this. That doesn't make it right. <laughs> We have to check our traditions. That, that's usually one of the drivers. The next thing I would ask us to do is kind of a practicing thing, and it's practice a new identity. Practice a new identity. Paul says that you and I have been clothed in Christ, that we've taken off the old identity, and we've put on a new identity. And so oftentimes what, what we do is we just go through and we're like, great, praise God, I'm a new creation. But we don't practice the identity. You see, practicing something new takes time, and it's always mechanical and clunky at first. Uh, when I learned to ride a bike, <clears throat> I fell a lot. I don't remember a whole lot about the experience, but I remember falling a lot. My dad started me in the grass. He's like, you got to hold the handlebars this way. He'd hold on to the seat, and then uh, he'd run with me. Uh, at the time, he could still run quite well. I don't know about now. But um, he, he ran with me in the grass, and he held onto the seat, and then uh, there was a point where he, was, he would let go, but then he was coaching me. Now pedal, right, left, don't, don't look, look ahead, don't look down. Oh, he crashed. Okay, let's try it again. And it was very mechanical, but over time, you just develop this muscle memory. And we think that, well, if it's true, I should just have the muscle memory. I should just be there, right? No, that's not how it works. It takes practice. You and I need to practice having a new identity. We need to practice it for ourselves. When we go into a social situation, when we come to the church, we have to remind ourselves before we walk through the door, any other identity has to get checked at the door. Churches, especially financially, get in all sorts of situations here. Well, I want this thing with my money. That's fine. You should have checked that at the door. Well, I want you to do this. You work for me. No, I, I don't. I don't work for you. There's no hierarchy in here. You, the moment you walk in here, your identity in Christ makes you an equal among equals. It makes you a gift among gifts, a son among sons, and I mean that as status. Equal co-inheritors of the kingdom. So you and I, we have to practice that. Before you come in the doors on a Sunday morning, before you enter into your home groups, before you go into a place, you've got to remind yourself, I've put on Christ. I am in Christ. That's my identity. And nothing that I experience here will change that. Every morning uh, when I drive our, our kids to school, before they get out of, of the car, I, I say, hey, remember who you are. It's one of the last things I tell them. Remember who you are. I know. Thanks. Remember who you are too. It's kind of become like this love you, love you sort of a thing. But then I have to stop and slow down. What, what do you think that means? Well, it means that I'm, I'm God's son. Exactly. It does. Don't let anybody change that. They have to practice it every day. You and I have to practice it every day, but we also have to practice viewing others in Christ as well. It's one thing to accept it for yourself, but if we only accept it for ourselves, we kind of get still oddly and ironically in this arrogant position. Well, I'm a son of, of Christ. That's okay. So is the person you're about to interact with. And maybe instead of interacting with people based on your comfortability, maybe interacting with somebody based on what they can provide for you or not provide for you, maybe we could start interacting with each other and seeing one another as in Christ, clothed in Christ. We have to start practicing that. We have to actually start viewing one another differently. We have to start recognizing our tradition and practicing viewing one another without any of those dividing walls that society has put up around us. And then just uh, the, the third thing is that we have to, it's kind of another practice thing, but affirm the work God is doing in others. We have to affirm the work God is doing in others. 
Now, this is going to be one of the most stretching things out of all three of these that you practice, and I'll tell you why. Because the moment you start interacting with others in a way where you verbally affirm things you observe in their life that God is doing to build them into a new creation, the moment you start affirming that, you are instantly going to start dealing with the, oh, but then if I affirm them in that, what does that mean about me? What if I affirm them in this way and they get elevated in, in a position of authority and, and then there's no room for me? All of us have to, to wrestle with our mentality of lack and limited love and acceptance. And I think it goes all the way back to our earliest childhood. Who was the favorite in the family? Because there's only enough love for one person in the same way. We can't all be loved in the same way. That's what we learned. No, that's what the world does. That's part of our tradition. But if we're practicing a new identity, one of the ways we can practice that is by affirming the work God is doing in other people. We watch who they are becoming. We watch how they practice their gifts. And then we're able to say, hey, today you shared during, uh, you shared during prayer. You, you shared a prophetic word. And I just want to affirm you that God is working and moving in you. And I love it. Thank you so much. Would you pray for me? Now, I get it because I've done this before, but we go to churches and conferences, and the pastor or the speaker stands up, and they're sharing all these things, and we're like, I want what he has, or I want what she has, and so we go to that person to pray for us, and the instant we do that, we set somebody else up on a pedestal as not equal in Christ. But if we could start affirming the work God is doing in somebody else, then we can start accepting and receiving the gifts that everybody has to offer. We start learning what God is teaching them. And we get, a, we get a chance to help shape them and affirm them and love them by saying, you know what? Some of, some of the most powerful words in the English language when it's words of blessing is, I see in you. I see in you God's movement. There, I don't see many people who love others and listen the way you, you listen. Thank you for doing that. I see in you God's work and growth. You aren't the same, you're not the same person you used to be. I love what God is doing in you. That's when the family actually starts to feel equal. I want to call us to be a people who are checking our tradition, practicing a new identity, and affirming the work that God is doing all around us through the lives of other people, and wrestling with the, that mentality of lack, and putting in place an attitude of humility and love and graciousness that doesn't just see what God is doing in other people, but it actually might even enable what God is doing in somebody else. That's what I'm calling us to do. We're going to listen to the Lord for a moment. I want to invite the worship team up. And as we do that, I have one thing that I've just felt impressed on my heart over the course of this week. As I look at the erasure of boundaries and, and the, the dividing walls of, of the things in society that make us different. And, and I want to do something really quick, and it's two parts. And the first part is I want to ask the guys in the room to stand. Now, what I'm about to say isn't meant to bring guilt or condemnation, but you standing today, you are acting as a representative for not just every man in this church, but every man in our tradition of the Christian Missionary Alliance and every man in the kingdom of God who has helped raise up walls where other people couldn't get where, they, where God was calling them. I'm not saying you've done it, but I'm asking you to stand in the place of those who have with me as we pray and corporately confess that we haven't done what Paul asked us to do. I want to ask guys just to hold out your hands. And this is going to be an act of releasing. And all you need to do is, is be with me in this prayer as we pray this. Father, we stand in a line of men who have used uh, used our own position, knowingly and unknowingly, to limit other people from the place you've called them to.
God, we confess and we stand before you today as representatives of people who have limited the call you have on others' lives because that's not how we do it or that's not how I grew up or that's not whatever. Lord Jesus, we're sorry and we repent. Would you make us into people who are springboards and platforms from which others can launch into the calling you have given them? In Jesus' name, amen. Men, I want to ask you to sit down, and women, I want to ask you to stand up. I've been looking forward to this. I don't know why, but for whatever reason, however it's worked out, some of you have been told that you don't fit in the role that you feel God has called you to. And I'm sorry. Some of you have felt you have giftings and leadings of the Spirit but there were people around you that said, that's great, but you can't use it in the church. And I'm sorry. I wanna pray over you. I wanna pray over you a commissioning and a healing for everywhere you were told you can't do that. I wanna pray over you a healing for everywhere that somebody else told you you weren't stable enough or you weren't able to operate in the way that they needed you to operate. I'm sorry. And men, this is where we still participate. I just want to ask you to raise your hand towards women around you. Women, I just want you to to be in a receiving posture if you're willing. And I want to pray over you. Jesus, again, we we confess that some of the people in this room have been limited by our choices and actions or acts of indecision. Would you forgive us? And Lord, would you reawaken dreams in the hearts of the women in this church? I I hear the Lord say to you this morning that he sees that you have been some of the most faithful ones in the church throughout time and history, though you've gone unseen. That your faithfulness is a testament to his faithfulness. And that you have served well and you have been, you've been a good daughter of the king. And we release in you all of the giftings that Jesus says you have. We step out of your way and we give you permission to do what Jesus has commissioned you to do. And we say yes to it. In Jesus' name, amen.